The agenda this week assessed the state of democracy in Ontario, explored Canada's underground economy, and learned how libraries are adapting in this era of technology. The agenda's week in review begins with the problem of labour trafficking in this province. The first thing to understand is that it's all legal, most of this. When we're talking about farm workers, for example, working without uh, a break or 12, 14 hours a day, that's legal under Ontario labour law, right? When we're talking about theft of wages, uh, people being housed in warehouses, again, that is part and parcel. And that's because the immigration law has created this fundamental power imbalance, not my words, Minister Carla Qualtrers, that makes it impossible for people to assert their rights. Mm. Um, there's about 125,000 temporary foreign workers in the country, uh, but there's 1.2 million people on temporary permits. And there's this, uh, you know, in our experience, for example, these workers that we, we just spoke about, they were being paid below 13 bucks an hour. But now that the police is involved, the, they can't actually get their money back because it's the Ministry of Labor that controls uh, getting your money back, right? O it's Ontario Ministry of Labor? Ontario Ministry of Labor, and they're not involved. So when we start talking about things as trafficking versus labor exploitation, the police get involved and we don't really act, workers don't gain anything. And that's the fundamental issue. Workers need their wages back. We talked to these workers before the police raid and some of them decided they didn't want to leave because at least they had a job. Hmm. Now they've been housed for two months, as Loli knows. They're going to maybe get TRPs. They won't be renewed again. TRPs? Temporary resident permits, which won't be renewed, as Loli knows. And so we end up with this, this um, making it about trafficking takes away the fact that this is part and parcel of the immigration system. And the fundamental issue is lack of permanent resident status. Hmm. As you watch this issue, have you noticed an uptick more recently in the exploitation of workers? Well, we can say that that have been happening before. Now is more like uh, in the, with the uh, people, like uh, the police now is learning that there is a labor trafficking. The labor trafficking has been happening a long time ago, especially with the immigration uh, programs, because they come with a close work permit. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a close work permit working here with TVO, no? And like me, I work where I want, and it's the organization where I am. But they don't. They have to work for that employer. And that's the problem. It's immigration pro programs that they make them vulnerable to be exploited because sometimes the employer is not a good employer, like we found. And then they come to this recruiter and say, I will find you a better job. And they move them to another place. And at the moment that you change of job, you lost your work permit mm -hmm. because you are breaking part of the contract that you need to work for that employer. Let's just understand, Julia, because uh, we want to understand how pervasive this is. Do we say that most employers are pretty good, but there are some bad apples, or is it worse than that? So uh, we really don't know, and part of it is because awareness is so low and people are not coming forward. Um, it's about employers, and there's good ones and there's bad ones, but we also see exploitation taking place amongst peers and managers and various levels of kind of the management structure um, within these industries where you see large majorities of temporary foreign workers. Um, so in our first year of operating the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline, about 6% of cases that we identified were labor trafficking cases, um, but that's really the tip of the iceberg. Like we know that it's underreported, and part of it is also because it takes very unique targeted outreach strategies to be able to connect with migrants because they're so isolated in our communities. Many are coming with language barriers, they're in rural and remote areas, they're reliant on their employer to transport them to places, and they're also not eligible for the same services as other permanent residents and citizens. So we've got a really robust set of programs and services for uh, settlement, uh, immigration settlement in Canada. They're actually not mandated to serve temporary foreign workers. Hmm. So if we get a call on the hotline and someone's in an abusive situation and they want to be able to access housing supports or service navigation, there's a whole ecosystem of supports that categorically excludes temporary foreign workers, hmm. making them more vulnerable to exploitation and more reliant on their employers. What countries typically are we seeing these workers coming to Canada from? So we have about 2,000 members who are migrants, in just in agriculture, 35,000 in total. And they're coming from, you know, in the agriculture sector, people are coming from Jamaica, from Mexico, from Philippines, all of these different countries. And when they're here, as, as Loli said, once they're on employer-dependent permits, it is impossible to be able to assert your rights. This is really crucial. 
If you have a right, say, to decent wages, how are you going to speak up? Because when you speak up, your employer can fire you. They can make you homeless because they're, you're kicked out of the country. They can make it so that you don't come back in the future. Exactly. You can't get employment insurance. So, really, it's immigration laws that give employers the power to exploit people, and permanent resident status is the only solution to make it better. In 40 years, no government in the province of Ontario ever used the notwithstanding clause of the Constitution to set aside constitutionally protected charter rights but this government has done it a couple of times and tried to do it more than that. For those who believe that that is not consistent with democratic governance in the province of Ontario, what would you say? Well, look, I'll say this. I know there's a lot of talk of the charter and, and what, the, uh, uh, what they envisioned when they brought it in. Look, when the charter was brought in, there were no cell phones. There were no computers in every home. Uh, most Canadians didn't have uh, uh, cable, uh, cable TV. Most had one phone in their house. We still had smoking on planes and in restaurants. It is a very different time frame uh, when the Constitution was drafted to where it is today. The courts weren't as active when, uh, uh, when uh, activists, when the, uh, the charter was, uh, was, was brought in. So the, it is evolving. It is always evolving, but the system is there. A, there is a notwithstanding clause. The, the provinces have utilized that, but the courts have also stepped in when they have disagreed with the, a province's use of it. And that's where we're at today. So it, it, is, it is hard for me to, 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 uh, uh, to hear sometimes when people say, well, you know, you're using uh, a constitutionally, uh, a provision in the Constitution, but it's not the way it was, it was, uh, they considered it. Well, a Constitution is not meant to be uh, uh, unamendable, unmovable. That's why they brought in the notwithstanding clause, and that's why provinces are using it, perhaps more often, but we have evolved so much since the 1980s. This is not, there's, there's no such thing as social media back in the 1980s. Canada Post is how you communicated. Uh, I remember sitting in my living room with my family, you know, having to call Italy, and you got 15 seconds on the telephone because it was so expensive. So things have changed so much. So, you know, provinces are gonna continue to use this, and the courts will continue to do their job in, uh, in, uh, in assessing whether it is the, the valid use of it. Let, let's follow up on that. Peter Tabins, I mean, it is a fair thing to point out that the Court of Appeal in Ontario just, you know, basically overturned the Ford government's use of the notwithstanding clause. They said, not only do we disagree, but you can't use it going forward on this particular election expenses thing as well. Does he have a point that the, the clause is in there to be used and therefore governments are using it more? Uh, I don't think he has a point, frankly. Uh, the understanding that I have is the clause was put in for very unusual and extreme situations, not meant to be used on a regular basis to deal with problems the government is facing on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Frankly, we've got a government that doesn't think that fundamental rights around electoral participation or bargaining are of consequence and is quite prepared to use the notwithstanding clause to ignore any constitutional challenge. Well, they tried to use it in the case of the labor negotiations and then they stood down when they got yeah. heat. Yeah, no, they got a huge amount of heat because people were outraged by it. And not just people in the trade union movement, people across the spectrum were saying, you've got to be kidding me. You're going to overturn these people's rights in this way without respecting what they fundamentally have a right to have access to. I, I think that the government is reaching on this. We're given all kinds of extraneous reasons as to why we should be able to use the, the notwithstanding clause. But if you actually respect the charter and people's rights, this is not something that you use as casually as this government does. You use it in very limited and extreme circumstances. That's not the case here. Let's remember can that. I, can, what I jump, we... can I jump in, Steve? But sure, go ahead. Just very briefly. First, uh, on the behalf of uh, Mr. Calander, with all respect, um, you're, you're on this panel, you're slightly outnumbered because you've got Janet Ecker, Steve Pagan, and me who covered Bill Davis, the late Bill Davis, who spoke out against the Charter, a great progressive conservative, I'm sure you'd agree. Spoke out against the use of the yeah. notwithstanding clause. Uh, uh, thank you. And, it's, it's, <laughs> it, the, 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 and, and the reason he didn't like the usage of it was it seemed like a trivial usage of it in the times that Mr. Ford has invoked it, as I'm sure you know. Look, there, there is a decent argument an arguable case for having a notwithstanding clause. A great new Democrat, Mr. Tabins, Mr. Tabins, uh, Alan Blakeney, fought strongly for uh, having letting the legislators have the final say. Mm -hmm. But in this case, what what it, what grates is that it's being used in an arbitrary way by the yeah. Ford government, in particular on third-party advertising, where the where the previous Liberal government had a very decent compromise on third-party advertising 
let's control it six months before an election. And the Ford government out of nowhere said, no, let's double that to 12 months. So it was everything is capricious in this particular uh, discussion on, on the charter. And that's what I think is concerning for many people. The underground economy, of course, referring to activities uh, whose goal is, uh, well, basically not to pay taxes. And then there is not paying taxes itself. So let's start there. Between 2014 and 2018, I'm told roughly $112 billion did not find their way into public coffers that should have. Why didn't it? <laughs> well, well, that that's a <laughs> that that that's a great that's a great question. Um, that the number that you cite is something that we call um, we call tax gap analysis which is simply an attempt to figure out, looking at, okay, how much tax money do we actually gather? And theoretically, how much money ought we to gather? And what is the, the difference between those two? And some of the reasons that we don't manage to um, collect all of those tax dollars would be things like economic activity that sort of goes unmonitored. So whether you call that the informal economy or the underground economy, but sort of the payment of wages, um, the purchase of materials, all kinds of things that happen, but that actually happen outside of sort of the, the, the formal um, reporting structures that would mandate, the, that, that would say something about taxation. And let me do a quick follow-up with you, because I suspect our viewers and listeners will remember the whole Panama Papers scandal and all of the untaxed money that was uh, leaving the country. The assumption was that the Canada Revenue Agency would somehow change the way they do business to prevent all of that, or at least more of that, from happening. Have they, in fact, changed the way they do business to prevent all of that or more of that from happening? <laughs> well, certainly, they've certainly received more resources. Um, and since 2014, they've introduced a, a neat little thing to deal with international tax evasion, which is a, a, an incentivized snitch line. Um, but, but generally, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to sort, to sort of uh, contain. They have introduced sort of, I suppose, more monitoring, more, more auditing, and they've drawn on the information that was made available in the Panama Papers and others to sort of go after um, particular entities. So, so they've done a lot, but it's a very, very difficult thing to confront. Okay, Vanessa, as we suggested off the top, there seems to be uh, as much underground economy in this country as we spend on health care in the province of Ontario every year, and that's a lot of money, almost $70 billion. From your perspective as an anti-fraud consultant, how pervasive is this in the lives of most Canadians? Well, I mean, if you're asking me whether most Canadians are engaged in money laundering, the answer is no. Um, but really, I think the big issue is whether we're targeting the right kinds of people who are committing fraud or who are, I think more importantly, also uh, engaging in other kinds of activities related to money laundering that have real um, and significant uh, political and social costs. Uh, laundering funds from corruption, for example, capital flight coming to Canada is a significant problem in that it has knock-on effects for Canadians who want to buy things like homes, for example. Um, so the way that we're managing this problem, I think, does impact the lives of everyday Canadians. How so? Well, think about it. If you want to buy a home and there's low inventory somewhere because uh, in part, not in whole, but in part, there's been capital flight from elsewhere. Um, people see Canada as an attractive place and a safe place to park their money. That's going to impact the inventory available. That's going to drive up house prices. So. Um, people who want to buy homes uh, and are unable to buy homes because they can't afford them are directly impacted. Noah, is there a way for the average Canadian to insulate him or herself from becoming a victim of this kind of corruption? Yeah, I think so. Firstly, I think you need to separate um, the innocent Canadians from the organizations, perhaps, that might engage in this kind of corruption. Um, mm -hmm. When we're talking about capital flight and that kind of thing, it's it's often not just people in their individual names that are investing in, for example, residential real estate. It might be done through shell companies, anonymous companies, um, with the very intention of disguising who that person is behind it. Um, and so I think for the average Canadian, uh, the way you really need to insulate yourself is that you have to be separated out from those, uh, those shell companies, those anonymous companies. Separated out means what? So for example, if, um, if, if we're going to go after the owners of those um, of those shell companies, I think we need ways in which we can hold um, organizations responsible that is very different from 
from um, holding individuals responsible. And we have some of this in our legal framework. Uh, we're kind of the responsibility of organizations versus individuals. But I think that's generally one of the ways that we can evolve in that, uh, in that way to protect innocent employees. Mary, if I asked you the same question, the difference between the library of 25 years ago and today, what would you say? I think it's the opportunity to uh, to be together, to commune. I think that social inclusion element, you know, there aren't very many places left actually where people can come, gather, uh, create, or just be uh, in, in, in society. So that social inclusion component has changed and we really have been able to uh, uh, develop our programs and services to meet those needs. Shamika, let me ask you about one of your previous experiences, because I gather you were uh, involved in the redesigning of the Cosset Library in Memphis, and in doing so, you came to Toronto to check out what was happening in this city here. What did you see or learn about here that you brought to Memphis with you? Oh, so much. You know, I had a wonderful opportunity. The library project that we did here in Memphis, uh, under the direction of Keenan McCloy, who's a phenomenal leader, uh, the city mayor, uh, in, a, in a national initiative called Reimagine the Civic Commons, uh, afforded me the opportunity to come to Toronto uh, in the middle of 2018. Uh, and we visited a number of places, not just libraries. We went to uh, uh, community centers, we went to parks. Uh, and of course, you know, as someone who works for libraries, I had to sneak away and check out a couple of libraries. And so, you know, one of the really interesting things that I saw, and Victor's already talked about this, is just the way that they were thinking about technology and how they were thinking about not only giving access to technology, of course, she's talked about green screens and uh, uh, various recording equipment, uh, but also kind of providing access through technology. And what I mean by that is not just saying, hey, here's a range of things that we have in terms of computers and digital resources, but here's how you can use these things. Here's uh, uh, fundamental ways that you can use it to improve your life, uh, to, to upskill, to learn a new hobby, to uh, maybe change your uh, job prospects. And so that was really interesting. Also, something that I really loved was at the time, uh, was a, an innovator in residence program that I really, really love. And I saw this as a really interesting way of bringing the community in and really leveraging the, the knowledge and the strengths and the skills of the community and making the library a very relational place, not just a place where, hey, I come and I get a book and I leave, or I come and, and I, I attend a library program and I leave. But it's like, no, I'm going to actually bring something with me. I'm going to bring uh, uh, things that I'm passionate about. I'm going to share those uh, in a public space like like a library. And so we were able to use those things and, and really infuse a lot of that into the project that we did in Memphis. Sabrina, let me pick up on that with you. If we were to go into the Blue Mountains Public Library in Thornbury today, uh, what would be what would we be able to do beyond just borrow some books? Well, that's an excellent question. We have a creator space, which is what we call our maker space. Many libraries have these. And it is a place where you can come and play and explore and test out technology. So from little children being able to do animation programs to adults coming in and borrowing our professional videography equipment, uh, whether it's a case where you wanna do an ad for your business or you just wanna have you know, a great family event, these are things that you can do in libraries today. Our uh, coding programs are active for all children. And one of the speakers mentioned, uh, these are the skills that we need to build in our citizenry. It's not just about fun and playtime. Sometimes it's a case where you wanna test something out before you purchase it. Other times it's the only opportunity you have for economic reasons, but our society, is requiring these aspects of digital literacy. So we're building these, sk these skill sets in our citizens. So hopefully we're building new job opportunities for adults and certainly uh, making sure that our youth are going to be strong employees of the future. Vickery, when did the library become more than just about borrowing books? Well, libraries have always been about that, to be perfectly honest. About more than just borrowing books? Just about borrowing books. You know, um, we've had, for instance, newcomer services in our libraries for many, many years. And this is where newcomer um, uh, agencies come into the library. We have them in about 16 of our branches. And they support newcomers uh, in, in making their way and integrating into uh, Canadian and Toronto society. 
And, uh, and so public libraries have been about that for a long, long time. We support all sorts of different literacies, financial literacy, um, uh, digital literacy that we've been talking about. Uh, so the library's been about about that for a long time, but certainly I think we think about books and we think about reading programs, we think about story times, which are all still the heart and soul of public libraries, but there's always been so much more going on. It's just that in recent years, it's accelerated. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations on our website, tvo.org our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash The Agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash The Agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.